wanted to say a couple of words, but uh, the interpreter cannot interpret because, oh, that's, that's good, that's good. The microphone is being used at last. So I'm sorry uh, to intervene into the introduction, uh, but I'll be very brief, three points. Let, let me welcome you on behalf of the Czech Literature Center, thanks to which uh, Alex uh, has come to our country and that has cooperated in preparation of this week, uh, well, of this evening together with the library. I thank Joachim that he took the lead of the evening. The second thing, pleasure. Let me be also very brief on this topic. I'm very pleased, I have a great pleasure that uh, Czech literature is being translated into English, that it's being done by Alex, that Alex has come to Prague, that we can do that to, together with the library, and that you came to this place tonight. The third point, it's not the very last uh, program the Czech Liter Literature Center has been preparing. We have other interesting residents among us. There will be, perhaps she's all already here, Yevgenia Orkolenko, a woman writer from Ukraine. She will give a lecture on December the 14th at the uh, Faculty of uh, Philosophy on the events in Maidan. There will be a translator into German and all the other information in details or our invitations, including venues and uh, dates, are available at our website and at our Facebook page. So, nebudeme dále mluvit česky, prosím, vezměte si sluchátka. Tohle jsou uh, úvodní slova, která jsem chtěla říct, a technická poznámka. Thank you for having come, and uh, I'll pass the floor to our moderator and our guest. By Saint Jeronim, it was exhausting, such a short introduction. Well, but still, I wanted to thank the Czech Literature Center as well. This is otherwise financially demanding for me to come over to come to the Czech Republic. So thanks to them, the Czech Literature Center, I've been able to come for three weeks now. And I came with uh, the aim to learn more about Czech classics, Czech women writers. These are the white places I identify whenever translating from Czech to English. So I came with a particular purpose to get more information about women authors, women writers that could be translated or should be translated into English since they haven't been yet. So that's the background of my current stay in Prague. How did I happen to come to Czech language. It was a real coincidence. I studied uh, uh, zoology at the university, as Joachim mentioned, and I had a girlfriend who studied uh, political science. And in one course, she and her schoolmates uh, read uh, the unbearable lightness of uh, being translated by Haim. And uh, that was the obligatory volume for them. She lent me the book. I read it too. To make it sure, we were in London and we decided together to go to Prague. It was in 1987. Indeed, we came through Vienna. Vienna. So we first landed in Brno, then in Prague. It was Eastern time. We took dinner in uh, the Indian restaurant in Stepanska Street, where local staff were rather irritated due to the fact that we didn't spend too much money. After that, I spent three weeks in France. So let me go the other way around. I finished my studies in 
zoology, then I was sort of hesitating because I found out that it was not the, the right job for me working in laboratory. I didn't communicate very well with uh, scientists. The only thing I liked in my studies was diving. That was okay. But still, it was probably not enough for maritime zoologist. I discussed it with a sort of a consultant among the professors I had, and uh, he agreed that probably science was not my field. It seems too difficult, isn't it, my narrative? Anyhow, so we came with my girlfriend to the Czechoslovakia, then I returned to the US, I started reading the information about uh, Czechoslovakia, and for reasons that are not clear for me anymore, I took the decision to work in uh, the domain uh, human rights protection. I found, indeed, a master's uh, curriculum in Columbia University. You could uh, study international politics. And there was a professor, Peter Cousy, a Czech professor that uh, translated at that time Milan Kundera's work into English. I was admitted to, to this uh, university, probably due to the fact that I had visited the Czechoslovakia already. And uh, so I started learning Czech already, having this idea I would uh, work in uh, human rights uh, defense. I started in autumn 1988. And uh, two years later, I came back to Czechoslovakia for two uh, months, out of which I spent one in Prague. At, that was a course organized for compatriots from Texas. I wasn't that, but that was a vacant place. And then I spent one month in Brno, so-called uh, summer school of uh, Slav studies. Then uh, I get got back to the US to continue my studies, but then in November, uh, November events happened, Velvet Revolution, and when in 1991 I went to uh, the information interview at uh, Helsinki a Human Watch, uh, they told me they were not interested anymore in uh, defending human rights in Eastern Europe. And so there was no chance for me, no opportunity to work for them. And a friend of mine, Aselena Strashkova, I had met in Prague, During that summer, in between two university years, she worked in the students' Listy and she told me that the Czech press agency was looking for the international department uh, new workers. So I began to exchange letters with uh, the director, what was his name? In fact, there are three former colleagues of mine, both uh, women and men, not Peter Ulm, no, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Cannot remember the name. Can I ask you something? I, I'm too long, am I not? No, you are perfect, perfect. It's just an Odyssea. Well, I apologize in advance to all Czechs for all the mistakes I make. No, no, you speak perfectly. I'm not a Bohemian study graduate. Uh, I'm not linguistic studies credit uh, neither. I wanted to ask you, Professor at Columbia University, since you took me there, I met in person Professor Cousy, translator of Kundera's work, and I am suspicious that it was him, this charismatic personality that uh, seduced both you and some others delving you into Czech language. Could you tell us something about him? Well, it's not obligatory if you don't feel like, but, but I think that this Professor Kusi was either gifted or cursed 
by this uh, check typicality, saying nonsenses. Once we stood in front of a museum and I said, why we should go inside? And he said, you have to get to know this shaking universe uh, experience, visiting a museum. And that was a kind of humor he had. And I think I, there's something I'm spreading. And you probably do. That was a good start for your translating work. Probably, yes. But what I preferred most, perhaps, was the work itself with language. Uh, before that, I had already learned French. I spoke French fluently. But it had never happened to, uh, to, uh, to my mind that I could uh, translate. So that was really thanks to Mr. Cousy that I began translating. We translated in his class. He was not very much convinced that you could learn a language by chatting in a classroom. So that was something we rarely did. We rather read, we rather listened to Voskovets various songs, we read lyrics, poems, and at that time he actually did translate Kundera. So from time to time he came to the classroom with some excerpts from a novel he was just working on at the time, if I'm not wrong. If I'm not wrong, it was immortality. So, when he was still Professor Cousy's student, it looked like that. But later on, here in Prague, how did you make ends meet? <laughs> oh, I don't understand the word protlocal. Mm, how did you, what did you do to sustain yourself? How did you? learn the language, uh, the ordinary, the standard language. I started uh, learning the language only when I moved uh, in the country, because uh, when studying at those different uh, schools, we rather uh, studied uh, things that were not uh, highly practical. I used to say that uh, when I came to Prague, I was able to read uh, newspapers. But I was not able to say, could you pass me salt, please? prosim sul. So you came to Prague with other people in a very extraordinary period, straight after the Velvet Revolution in the 1990s, that already enrobed in a mythology of their own. We had jokes already. A person traveling by train, there is a group of Americans, and he says, uh, keep your country unit. Uh, the, the Czech takes the American and throws him out of train. That was a joke, Alex, to be laughed at. I know another joke, but I don't remember it. Uh, I won't say, say it, I won't. No, I'm very bad at selling jokes. You know, suddenly there was a large community of Americans, of pe people either from the US or from the English-speaking countries. There were magazines in English uh, uh, published. What was it like for you? I had not expected to meet any foreigners here. I had to come in order to assume this job I got in the Czech, uh, Czech uh, press agency, an editor place in the international department. And then I discovered that Prague became indeed a destination, a main destination for young Americans. But uh, that was somehow unexpected. Nobody expected that. And then later on, I found out there were newspapers uh, in English with, uh, you, uh, at the origin, it was a quarterly, no, a monthly, excuse me. It was in English. There were different uh, forecasts. And my contact with uh, English-speaking countries 
trees uh, was implemented through this uh, magazine that didn't, does not exist anymore. They were looking for a person to translate. Uh, I think the first uh, issue was translated altogether. The issue one, for the issue one, I translated uh, an article I forgot the name of. Anyhow, the article was about a communist that was uh, photographed while cooking at home. And the title was Cooking with a Communist, Vaseins Komunistem. Uh, this magazine prognosis uh, had really a sense of humor. Was it Vasil Bilak? Could it, could it have been Vasil Bilak? Was he still alive at that time? Probably. It may have been he with, a, with an apron on. Quite funny. A long article. It was taken over from uh, the magazine Malaya Fronta or what. So how did you get to lit literally translation. What was your first book translated? Well, the first literary translations we did with uh, our professor Kusi at school, but the uh, next literary translation I probably first did for the magazine called Yasik, the language for older generations that was published in Prague since 1991 till 1994, probably. Maybe you can still find some issues on internet uh, on the S-C-R-I-P-E-D web page, should you somebody be interested. They, uh, the, the magazine was founded by Tommy Megzuna and Tom Hayek. They both uh, still live in Prague, they stayed here. And the magazine, in fact, was unique in the fact because they uh, published both the translations not uh, from Czech in English, but also from other languages uh, in, Engli in English, and also some other things that uh, were written by the local expats. Well. Well, 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 I feel that to translate uh, the Czech literature is uh, something exotic. When I close my eyes and I have uh, that big America and big world in front of my eyes, well, uh, I feel a little bit dizzy. And it uh, seems to me very special that you consecrate all your efforts uh, to the translations from the language that is called a little one. And I think that it uh, must uh, come uh, to mind of uh, anybody. So is there any chance for such a little language? But uh, it uh, probably would be the same with uh, Bulgarian, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, and such languages. Could you tell me something about it? You are absolutely right. But I believe that it does not depend on language, but on uh, the publishing house. Because uh, the small publishing house, they do not have uh, enough funds. They uh, cannot afford for a major advertisement campaign. Uh, it also depends on how many reviewers they can find and how uh, many reviews can be published and such. And how is it done? Uh, what if uh, we have here a genius author or genial author who has got in uh, his uh, bag uh, the handwriting of his new novel? So uh, should he come to you and say you have to publish it or he should wait or how is it done? No, out of those 13 books that uh, I translated up to now, only in two cases that was my initiative when I came to the publisher and uh, 
these were both uh, your books just by chance the sister and the devil's workshop and in all uh, the cases i was hired with the fact that the agent well let's put it this way the book is sold usually by an agent who represents uh, the author or she author the agent sells uh, the uh, rights to the copyright to the publishing house then they sign the contract and then the next contract The publishing house signs with me. So these are two different things. So it means that when the agent sells the rights uh, to uh, the publishing house, he can also recommend somebody for translation. And in about a half of the cases, agent was Eckhard de Bruen, Dutchman, whom quite probably many of you know. Uh, well, I would like to add in uh, this respect. So uh, is the case as such that the Czech literature is uh, sold into abroad only two agents, Dana Blatna from Brno and Edgar de Bruyne from Amsterdam, and then an agent, Maria Šíleny, who lives half in Czechia and half in Germany. And uh, I met her for uh, the first uh, time uh, on a Monday um, during the event with uh, David Zabransky. Uh, as an American from Big Pet, from Big Apple, Apple, you are really kind of playboy. How do you assess uh, the work of the Czech agents? We shall not tell them. From the point of view of the author, or, well, agent works for an author and not for the country or for the culture, in my opinion. Well, well, I don't know how to take this question. Okay, so uh, let's put it this way. You are not among uh, those people who participate in the first somewhere in Scandinavia. It, uh, it is no sense. I was twice at the fair in London, but not because of the fact that I would like to find some work. How about Frankfurt? I have never been there. Uh, well, I don't know whom to meet there. I see. Okay, please repeat. Once again, how does it happen that the book is published? The writer who is here among us must have an agent. Well, he must find an agent or she agent, yes. This is how it all starts. And then an agent uh, strives to find the publishing house where uh, the book uh, may be published, where it is, uh, where it can be within uh, their publisher's plan. Okay, and when all goes well, so then the book is published in the States, it is sold uh, in the printing of several million pieces, yes, of course, and uh, then it's easy. So how do you feel when your translations, about which I do not doubt that they are excellent, when the printing is very low? Uh, so I am not uh, interested now whether it is good or not, but how much uh, do you sell? What is the printing, 10 pieces or 10, 10 issues or 20? I usually translate for small publishing house where the printing is about 1,000 uh, books here, here in Czechia, 1,500 here in Czechia. Yes, and uh, well, uh, there were no reprints. And uh, isn't it depressive? No, it is not. Well, I work for the rate that is calculated per word. And it means that I usually do not uh, get uh, the royalties. 
I usually do not uh, expect that. It happened several times, and it, of course, um, is dependent uh, or it depends on uh, the contract, whether all starts from uh, the first book sold or not. And usually uh, the, the agreements uh, are written in such a way that I uh, get the royalty only as late as, well, I, I do not know the exact expression, uh, once Uh, when the advance payment is paid. Ano, když, když se vyplatí záloha. Záloha? Když se vyplatí záloha. And uh, this uh, usually does not happen <laughs> well. And uh, still, I shall ask, because uh, uh, it is an issue about which I usually speak with my friends. Well, I would like to add still, it's not depressive, because for me, it's uh, the winning situation when uh, the book is published. Since I believe that the readers of the foreign literature or international literature usually appreciate it and it is more or less, in my opinion, the same as with uh, the local novels at, at us. They are also sold in uh, small printings, probably not that low as uh, translations, but uh, this is how it is. These are usually not the best sellers, but it does not mean that they are not important for people. And don't you think, for instance, that uh, the current Czech literature is kind of boring or uh, non-understandable? Just on contrary, I do believe that, for instance, Tomáš Zmeškal several years ago had the speech where he said, uh, I have more optimistic opinion on Czech literature than Czech themselves, since I do believe that uh, many excellent things are published in Czech, and I am really sorry that there are uh, not more uh, translators uh, from Czech in English or other languages. Are you also a reader? I have to read all the time. I read almost every day something. So I would be interested whether you are also diving into Czech literature. When I translate, I, uh, in fact, cannot read because I start to analyze the text and uh, I cannot read it as a story anymore. That's why lately I uh, read very little, I have to admit. Over the past year, I managed to read only one novel in English. Um, during one year, one novel? You are here in the library. OK. But uh, then uh, there are other times when I can read three novels per month, but it did not happen lately. OK, and when uh, you work on some translation, do you have uh, kind of your working rhythm? It means that in uh, the morning you wake up, you make coffee and you start, or do you prefer to work in the evenings? Me, I am an afternoon and evening person. Well. Uh, I am addicted to the news, as uh, probably the majority of people, and my day usually starts with reading the news. And uh, when uh, there is a deadline, and tempus uh, fugit, I of course cannot uh, take care about any news. I am able to do that, but. Uh, often, and usually it is probably a bad habit, but I do not start my day with translations, and I should. Yeah, you are right. 
It is uh, said uh, that uh, a man is uh, the freshest, uh, the, the brain is working perfectly uh, when you wake up, so then you are fresh. And I destroy it with uh, watching or hearing the news. Well, uh, I am interested in your rhythm of work because when you translated uh, the novel Sister, uh, well, I was interested in your style of your work uh, because I think you must be sober when you work. Well, now I am sober and I work sober. Well, that's good. Well, and uh, do you also feel that is uh, the question that pursues me when the uh, publishers ask you whether the Czech literature uh, is characteristic with uh, something. I know it's very complex <laughs> question, or not. Uh, the authors uh, really vary a lot. What is unique uh, for the Czech uh, literature is that it is written in a Czech. <laughs> well, I do believe that Contrary to other translators, the fact that you lived in Prague in the 90s, I believe, uh, well, I remember uh, how we visited the pubs, clubs, and concerts, and I think that you quite extraordinarily uh, got the colloquial language you know it, but uh, this language is also developing. Yes, so now when you come to Prague after many, many years, do you feel that uh, Czech has been changing a bit? Definitely, and uh, I would like to come back also to that, uh, what was mentioned before. That's why I say that uh, I um, am not a graduate of the Bohemian study. I have never studied literature. I have never studied Czech as a language. I studied it as uh, a tool to uh, write uh, about the human rights. So my perspective is uh, different. I am not linguist. I am not an academician. So definitely there are uh, the scientists who believe that the Czech literature has got some sense. Oh, well. Uh, I am unable, well, there are professors with plenty of time who can uh, read the novels one after another, and uh, they uh, know much more about the Czech literature than I do, Christopher Harvard or uh, Bolton or Mr. Chidnis. They know more than me, by far. And uh, I also rely on them to a certain extent when I uh, have some issue to solve. I ask them to help me. For instance, uh, when I translated for the Carolinum uh, publishing house, uh, writer Josef Jelička, I had the question on Rajendru, who is a professor at uh, the Bristol University, and he also uh, wrote the epilogue to this book. So I am here for a little, for a sh very short time now. So I noticed uh, that uh, there are many English words uh, in your language when compared to two years ago no doubt about it. And yesterday I spoke uh, with uh, many people during this stay, but uh, it's not long when somebody told me that it is very, uh, it, is, it is horrible that uh, Czechs also say have a nice day. Mějte hezký den. Mrs. Lomova uh, said, so it's not Czech. And we, we often say definitely or sure, určitě. Well, 
uh, uh, well, maybe you took it from your famous hockey player. He, he says, tak určitě, so sure. We say hoďka, uh, little hour or uh, obídek, little lunch, and also people said about death, koncík, a little end. Well, you are by far bigger expert on Czech than me. Okay, well, but uh, I am aware of the fact that the writers also have uh, many secret um, examples in front of them. Uh, so is there anybody whom you adore? How do you mean it? In what? Uh, I think that for some uh, translators, uh, Mr. Zaurálek is a mythic uh, person who translated Selin from French. So are you aware also of uh, such uh, right of, uh, of such translators so in whom you are interested? In English, of course, Michael Henry Hyam. He was uh, a big translator. He was uh, well known for his translations of Czech authors and uh, Margaret Jewel Costa. Haim uh, is not alive, but uh, Margaret uh, is fantastic. Edith Grossman from Spanish. There are many, heaps, I would say. <coughs> I didn't know that. There are some, really, there are men, more of them, but my head is blank now. Can I give you another question? In this support to literature translations, what support should be given by the state? I know that uh, in Norwegia, the support is given by the state, and therefore all those boring detective stories from Scandinavia are available everywhere. For a small language as a language, for a small language as a Czech, I think the state support is necessary, and I know that. At at least half of my translations uh, could not have been published without the Czech state uh, support. Because once more for small publishers, it's difficult. Well, the state is good maker. There are some states that are better good makers, and there are other states that are less good makers. They are less generous. Some states are horrible. Could you say right now, I know that we once spoke about it with Edgar de Bruin, our friend. Could you say straight away a scheme for Czech literature support? Languages that are mostly translated into English are those that are most supported by respective states by the national states. I have here, for instance, a database by Czech Post, uh, they are heading uh, in Rochester, State New York, their own publishing house. And since uh, 2008, uh, he's been following what uh, literature trans translations have been published. It's not uh, non-fiction literature. They do not publish that. They uh, do not publish neither any reprints. So these figures from the period starting 2008 till now, you can see a list of uh, translated works quite clear. Of course, Spanish uh, comes from several countries, also translations into German from several countries. The same applies to Arabic. And French, they are so imposing. Yes, they invest a lot of money into translation works. And in addition to that, they have their people in New York and in London. 
that uh, make contacts with publishing houses, with editors, and they know what is being published by whom. And therefore, they do not lose unnecessary time by offering books to those who uh, to those uh, who will result in uh, translated books that will not be that will not arouse interest. So that's the way to be at the right time in the right place with right money. Of course, I like to say that money is always at stake, but also there is one more factor. And it is that French language and French uh, literature is almost not considered uh, in our country by, uh, not considered anymore as foreign. Everyone who studies at university is a high school graduate. Perhaps it's not valid anymore what I'm going to say now, but uh, it's a person who usually reads during his or her studies in French or German, in German, and therefore there's no need to explain to people why a French author should be translated and published. There's no need to explain that to population. Just if you say French literature, a common regular editor in UK or US will immediately recall several names. Whatever names. But it means that people have awareness of uh, French authors, of German authors. Immediately they recall some films or some uh, songs, music, uh, so that applies to major languages, while it does not for smaller languages. Probably it does not apply to Portuguese, neither, and still they have quite a high percentage of literature in translations. I know just Jose Saramang, that's uh, been translated a lot. I still have my ammunition, don't worry, but it seems to me that uh, for 45 minutes we've been speaking just two of us, uh, so if any of you, our dear audience, want to ask uh, our guests, uh, don't hesitate, your manuscript may become a bestseller after this evening, who knows? Perhaps one more thing may be interesting for the audience, and, and it is to know what's uh, being published uh, as uh, Czech literature trans in translations since 1987. I have a table I started to fill in several years ago. Here it is. It's freely available on the internet. Hold on. Where did I put it? Uh, here. I I'm cannot find it. Doesn't matter. Going back. Anyhow, I started with the year 1987, because when once I wrote an essay about Mark and Michael Heim, I stuck to a bibliography of Jerzy Kontun, Czech who worked in the library of the US Congress, and he compiled a bibliography of both Czech and Slovak literatures up to 1986. The first item was from 1832, if I'm not wrong. And when I wrote this essay about Heim, 
the aim was to uh, write about the influence Haim had had on translations into Czech. I didn't know what to write about, so I looked at his uh, works in translations. I found it interesting to see what was translated or not, and that was also a factor that contributed to this stay in Prague, because I found out that the ratio between men and women is very in unequal, that there's absolutely no gender, gender proportion. You mean that the same number of books uh, written by men and women uh, should be translated, should not be called rather beings and not men and women writers? Well, if you look at anthologies, usually the ratio, gender ratio, is more or less uh, fair, equal. And uh, I think that this uh, disbalance is really so astonishing in this case that uh, it definitely is a loss for readers. Why readers should know just the half of the writing population? So in this Koftun's uh, bibliography, the number of uh, works written by men writers was 137, and the number of female writers was seven in the period uh, exceeding 100 years. It's unfair. I don't say it's unfair necessarily. It's just a big loss. I don't mind whether the author is a man or a woman. I don't agree. Every human being writes based on his or her life experience. I don't say that there is just one perspective for women and another one for men. Of course, every writer writes based on his or her experience, and obviously, experience of women are different as compared to those of men, although they live in the same society. But genius writers, they do not show whether they were men or female. But there were so many genius authors we were not allowed to read because they were, well, that's a rubbish, I said, that's a nonsense. I meant uh, many genius writers, we could not have read them because why is it so that uh, anthology has half men writers and half female writers while I don't know. That's interesting. It's a vivid topic indeed. And therefore, we've been trying in the US to monitor that point. For many people, it's quite a surprise, this disbalance, this huge difference. And so I think that in our country, there are women who buy three quarters of books uh, issued. This is also an interesting figure. In general, I just doubt very much that uh, there is this uh, disproportion in books that uh, have been published. I think that for some reasons, and uh, it's practically impossible to specify uh, the reasons, but I would say that in a society, there is a tendency to publish a high number of uh, men authors than female authors. And if the society doesn't pay attention to it, it's a default uh, regime to publish rather men authors. Are there any statistics? There is, for instance, Victor's style of publishers. And it seems to me that the much more women writers are published in this country than men. But for literature and translations, the representation of men 
by far prevails over that of women. That's what I'm saying. Can I ask you something to totally different, as we say in Czech language, from a different barrel? Let's turn the page. I, look at this. In 1997, there was one anthology of uh, uh, Václav Havel's plays, plus one more play, and one work by Vaculík. 1988, Havel, anthology of poetry, Lustig, Havel, Škvorecký. Havel, Hrabal, Parel. We get to the revolutionary year. Parel was published in Cadbert Press Publishers, founded by Drops Wexel. It did not. It doesn't exist anymore. But that was a publishing house focused on Czech literature. There was also Škvorecký, Havel, 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 Hrabal, Čapek, Čapek, Fischerová. For the first time. Uh, Female author, Holub Holub, a well known name, Ota Pavel, a classic. And we are at 1991, Lustig Kundera Škvorecký. In 1992, I can see Pekarkova, the first contemporary female author, translated into English, plus two works by. Havel in, in the 1993, it's getting larger. I must admit, I don't know the name, Josef Hanslik. I hope the gentleman is not in the, hall, in the, in the, in the room. Also, Polacek by Cadbury Press, Ivan Klima, Kirsten. Kristova, um, biography of Havel, Škorecký Parel, and we are in 1994, Pekárková, second work, Čapek, Klima, Havel, anthology, Berkova, the first work translated, Alexandra Berkova, she's a good example of the phenomenon I've been just uh, speaking about. She's been published uh, most in anthologies among Czech uh, authors, but no her novel has been translated into English yet. And still, I think she has a good reputation. She's an important uh, author. 1995, Vopienka, the first one, Dubinka Čapek, Parabal Murer, a new young author, Klima, and then again anthology compiled by Paul Sol. Nineteen ninety-six, twice, Vivek. What's the <laughs> what's the time? We've done just one hour. The one who may be interested in this uh, list, you could send it to them. Yes, but still, as a matter of interest, let me show you the contemporary numbers. Not that I have my two translations uh, in them, but 2017, and if you look at 2016, how many books? were translated, partially due to the fact that uh, uh, some uh, books translated into English are now published in the Czech Republic, in different uh, publishing houses. And there are different names, there are different genres, there are more age categories. So I think that the Czech literature is now doing very well. It's perhaps not published so much by large publishers as in the past. Perhaps it's not written about so much in major media, but the one who wants to get to know something about Czech literature, such a person has much a better chance than, let's say, 10, 20 years ago. 
that's what I would, how I would describe it. What about if you read, uh, read to us now uh, an excerpt of your very good translation, if you agree? I do agree. And I will read from a book that makes me very happy, because uh, over the last uh, couple of years, I realized that it's important to promote not only books, but their authors as well, which is something that is commonly done uh, for French uh, authors, for, again, major languages. This book, you have all your books translated into English, and you are unique among contemporary Czech authors. Not all. Yes, all, except uh, short stories. And uh, a month ago, Sensible person has been published, but it's not translated yet. I'm joking, uh, sure, but that's great, yes, of course. Ma was pleased by that very much, very happy. Although the original version was published uh, in 1995. So 22 years later, it's been translated. Thank you. Should I read uh, in Czech? Read in English. Uh, Alex will uh, read a passage and then your questions. Pokud byste nevěděli, o čem ta knižka je, přečtu ze záložky. V, česky, v češtině se jmenuje Anděla, Anděl, v angličtině Angel Station. A je to tedy název zrušné stanice metra Anděl. V 90. letech bylo to dělnické neuspořádaná čtvrť s velkou částí romské a větnamské populace. Je tady poetický jazyk, je tady narkoman, prodavač obchodu a nábožensky založený člověk, kteří všichni hledají pokoj v duši prostřednictvím svých různých cest. I wrote this epilogue myself. There are publishers who do not write those accompanying texts on the cover, so I had to write it myself. Budu to, budu číst druhou kapitolu knihy, A máme tady jatka v češtině, což mi připomíná jatky v češtině. A musela jsem se poradit s tím, jak ho tady nazvat v angličtině. První slovo, které mě napadlo, první jméno, které mě napadlo, bylo buč, jako buč a k tomu buč řezník, takže jatek, jatky. Ale to je jméno, které má spoustu, vyvolává spoustu asociací v angličtině, takže ty jsem tam nechtěl do té knihy zanášet. A pak jsem přemýšlel o tom, co se vlastně odehrává v jatkách a nakonec jsem se rozhodl, že mu budu říkat jatek hux, hux. Hux blinked, but it didn't go away. The blood poured from the sky, falling into his eyes. He had an instinct to duck out of the way, huddle his body around the red spot spreading across his retina, wrap his muscles, tendons, bones, hair around it somehow. Everything that he knew beyond a doubt belonged to him and dissolved the vision inside him. He soon realized it was best to avoid the window, all windows. As long as he kept his gaze turned in toward the room, the crimson didn't flare up. He saw people, men, their shadows, and didn't look out the windows. He remembered quite clearly the first time the vision had come. He'd been standing at the intersection waiting for a tram when the sky coagulated. He sidestepped the people crowding onto the tram and looked, watched the low cumuli in the slow-moving sky above Angel Station, saw them run through with a crimson vein outlined in silver. Then the fleecy clouds let loose the red, caught him in the eyes. He'd had to lean against a lamppost. The sky was red. 
It was dazzling. He tried to move, felt a drip, drop, drip on his shoulders, neck, scalp, knew it was blood. Then he went on the lamb, took off, away from his turf, but the red flashes had found him. Here he'd made a habit of staying away from the barred windows, even when the frost coated them in arctic maps, covering up the sky. The vision was inside him still, and the jagged frost might have conjured up the image of a polar bear bleeding on fresh fallen snow, or something. Those kinds of fantasies he was happy to give up. I should have said, this is him in a uh, mental hospital. He wandered the corridors, shuffled his feet, got used to it. His first time here, he'd been ceaseless, sleepless even after the nth rohypnol. They gave him some other chemical. He woke up screaming, woke the others, caused a disturbance. Then the shots hit the spot, and at last he sank into dreams, awful ones. Colors and monsters tumbling over one another and crimson always came out on top. The unmistakable crimson of blood-soaked clouds from the planet Chaos. And the faces. It wasn't until later that he figured out what the red was, where the over-eager parts of his brain got it from and what released it into his scleral cells. Now he fell asleep, sinking into himself and seeing the faces, mostly the kind he could just as soon do without meeting. They were the sort of faces every tram is full of, every reading room, laundromat, any snack bar or swimming pool, as if his brain were replaying every encounter he'd ever had, especially the fleeting ones from the streets, the subway, faces. The tour would begin with the faces from the neighborhood. First to float in usually was the shopkeeper's ugly mug, then women, more women, assorted moms. Eventually it dawned on him which cash registers, corner stores, tram stops he'd seen them at. Mo <clears throat> moms with shopping bags with kids. Then he glided past the faces of his buddies, some he only knew from the waist up anyway, hunkered down in the pub in his dream, tipping back pints. He saw the quick-witted not much and the dazzling modla from Superdrug. There was Steffi, the scrawny waitress, leaning out the window, and her little sister, Dora the Bitch, the famous Telebingo winner. He spotted faces he recognized or semi-recognized from the street, fellow bus riders, the familiar strangers from the daily commute, a woman beautiful as a battleship who he'd met five years ago in the fall, the faces in his drowsy brain changing one into the next like a rotating picture flashing across endless walls of crystal. Then suddenly one of the eyes in the dream would come to a stop right in front of his eye, flicker, and the vein of red running through the white would burst, oozing blood. And the blood slowly engulfed the picture, flowing from the clouds and flowing from the faces, flowing toward him, he was sure. In the daytime he was scared to blink his left eye. That was where the vision usually began. Apart from that, he kept his cool, didn't talk to anyone but he'd spoken to start out with, just a word or two here and there to keep up appearances. He paced the corridors designated for it, ate off a plate whenever the staff slid one in front of him, washed the floor when he got a rag, gave coherent answers during doctor's rounds. Unquestioned, he said nothing. To the glad handers and other meddlesome types, he made it plain he was not to be disturbed. They thought he was crazy. He sat, stared, lay, stood, ate, now even slept too. At first he suffered pangs of guilt over Liuba, but his proud resolution, which though he didn't realize that he shared with approximately 70% of the whack jobs, fruitcakes, basket cases, and other patients, namely that he'd just get his act together and head back out into the streets, into the world, and especially back to her, Liuba, to make amends for his obvious faults and indiscretions, that resolution kept him on his feet. <coughs> He made up his mind not to sink any lower and did his best to steer clear of the people in whom he could sense the gaping abyss, of course in such a way so as to avoid the windows if possible. The ones who reeked of the abyss had no resolutions left, either that or they kept them hidden deep inside themselves, in a pit of pain, in a salty ocean of tears occasionally rippled by waves or whipped by hurricanes of hysteria. They lived a life of medication dull desperation. He could sense it passing them by in his tracks across the trampled linoleum, circling, always circling, in his hospital issue slippers that went flip, flop, flip. Maybe I ought to go see the eye guy, said Hooks, blinking into the darkness in the corner. Nah, screw it. My problems are of a mental nature, he diagnosticated. It didn't occur to him until later that what he saw was really there and that only he could see it. I'll stop there.
Well, when you like the text, then the translating is the easiest work under sun, right? Well, I know that was just a joke. Well, when it comes to St. Jeremy's, time is very quick. Do we have any question? And we need the microphone, please. Microphone. He does not, she does not. Rabal is, let's say, one of the most translated Czech authors. For instance, he does not have that many translations in English as in German or French or others or in Polish. Well, well, it's quite obvious that uh, Czech literature is much more translated into uh, the languages of the adjacent countries than in English. Uh, but uh, the best known translation of Harabal's work was done by Paul Wilson, I served the King of England. But I believe that the last translation of Harabal was made by Stacy Knecht, who for the first time translated from Czech before she translated from Dutch in English. But uh, others are Tommy Line, Michael Henry Heim. Definitely there are also other translators. He has got more translators. Could you tell us something about your work as such? I know that you can translate in different ways, and we have our own assets, but uh, what do you avoid, or on what do you focus? What have you learned over all those years? Uh, do you mean the process of translating as such? Yes, exactly. I believe that everybody has got its own routine, how to translate. I am aware that uh, there are people who read uh, the whole novel before they start, and some allegedly not. For instance, a famous uh, translator, Gregory Rebasa, who translated 100 Years of Solitude. And Garcia Marquez claimed that he never read the book in advance, just to have a fresh, fresh feel from the text. But uh, I really cannot imagine to proceed like that. Me, in fact, I translate. I do the first version uh, as quick as possible, in fact, and then I revise the text and I have at least two more versions separate. How do you mean it? So when you do the next version, do you write it uh, from the very beginning? No, I, wake on, I work on the original, on the first version with the fact that, uh, in fact, uh, I uh, need to wait uh, till the last version before I turn uh, to the author, and uh, then I also have my own informants. In New York, I have friends, uh, Mrs. Ivana Husakova and Irena Kovářeva, uh, whom I ask to help me before I contact an author. So um, when it concerns the interpretation or the things that I was not able to find on the web. Did I answer your question? Well, what is still the important for you? 
you try to get as close as possible to the author? Uh, is it uh, the conscious process how uh, to translate uh, the author? Well, you do the English version, but is it uh, the conscious, very conscious process? There are, uh, of course, some deviations. Yes, they are. Well, one uh, she translator whom I admire a lot, my friend, is Catherine Solver. She translates from Spanish. And she, several years ago, had the contribution uh, in uh, uh, or comment in the panel discussion where she claimed that we should not uh, speak about uh, uh, how uh, the translation is faithful, but we need to be persuasive. We cannot only translate the words. It must be persuasive and not correct. Well, at any price, we should not. Uh, we, we we should not. Uh, we should avoid the term of the literate uh, translation, because what it would mean to write exactly the same text again in the same language. So that that's an error of understanding the issue. Good evening. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you about the machine-aided translation, computer-aided translations. Do you believe in it? We smiled several years ago to those computer-aided translations, but now if uh, you use the Google Translate, it helps a lot. Well, well, yes, so sometimes it is very funny to translate or whether the help of Google, but I am well aware of the fact that some of my colleagues translate from French with the use of uh, such uh, tools. And I am uh, well aware also of the fact that uh, the technical translators, let's call them that way, they use not uh, the computer-aided translation, but uh, the software. Uh, that has the translation memory concerning uh, the terms. Uh, it uses your previous translation, and it applies the same translation uh, into uh, the next step. But that's just why it is impossible when it comes to the literary translation, because here we also have to take into consideration the style. And there are different connotations uh, for different uh, authors. So let's take Yachim, for instance, where I translated his work, The Devil's Workshop. There was a word subject, maybe. A little thing, that I think you said uh, subject, předmět. And I do remember that I insisted on a certain translation of this word because I translated it in uh, this uh, way uh, within the novel uh, City Sister Silver. And I knew that uh, there is uh, the connection with the previous text. So that's why I uh, explained it uh, to the editor in that way. Well, but I still uh, believe uh, that uh, such future is not that very far, because I was quite surprised many times with uh, the quality, because they work with the database. You can cooperate with it. Well, of course, it depends to what uh, extent the author uses the uh, original um, sentences. Uh, well, uh, there are, of course, the authors that use the colloquial, more colloquial language. So it depends on the phrases. So that's uh, how I would put it.
Well, so many questions. Three questions more. And uh, then uh, we can uh, have some drinks and some sandwiches. I love questions. That's my mistake. I had to stop 30 minutes uh, ago and but it was very nice. I am Polish and I live for quite some time in uh, Czechia and in Poland. Czech literature is uh, quite often translated, but all the time the same authors, Hrabal, Škvorecki, Hašek, even Topol, but it is very difficult to persuade possible publishers to uh, translate somebody else. So now I look at the work of Václav Vokolek uh, from his uh, uh, work, uh, Journey to the Hell. I uh, offered a translation of uh, this novel to Maruš. I know him. And uh, he operates uh, the publishing house. And we discussed this issue that uh, more women also should be published. And I uh, offered this uh, to him that he should finally publish uh, Mr. Václav Vokolek. And he said uh, that uh, he is even cursed that he publishes uh, too many men. And he said, so that's another man. And I tried to persuade him. And I said, but uh, Václav liked women a lot. I also spoke with Andrzej Jagodinski, who is the most significant translator of uh, Czech literature. And he said uh, he has got much work. And therefore, I decided I shall do it myself. I shall translate this novel. So I wanted to ask you, what should I do for um, persuading the possible publishers uh, that this work is worthwhile for translating. Uh, the sale uh, at uh, other countries? Well, it depends. What is uh, important for the publisher, for the publishing house? Every publisher has got uh, different priorities, and uh, I know that for uh, some time the introductions written by well-known authors are uh, used to make it more attractive. Well, uh, I... Uh, um, wrote some diploma works, and uh, I saw that uh, there uh, were people interested in uh, Václav's work at the universities. He uh, writes uh, in the way of romantic paradigm, and uh, Polish readers would be interested in it, uh, but they really need the translation sometimes. It also helps when uh, the author of the given country pushes uh, through the foreign author. It also sometimes uh, functions pretty well at us. I don't know how it is here. And the second question, do we have any other? Good evening, Mr. Zucker. As uh, every reader reads different authors, and some authors we can like and others not, so which authors uh, did you translate, uh, which, which you liked more? And uh, do you like translating Mr. Topol? Yes, yes, I am very much amused by that. Oh, that gentleman is curious. Well, but I must say that there is uh, not an easy translation. And uh, of course, uh, I shall uh, not uh, say here that I have some favorite author. You must be professional. City Sister Silver translation was the most complex for me, but then I translated Jedlička and uh, 
quite often I understood every word, but uh, it was not always that I understood the sense uh, of uh, the sentence or, or the main idea, the idea that was before it, behind it, in it. And now I also translated the, the novel by Petra Hulova, and it was also quite complex uh, from uh, other reasons. Uh, uh, that was uh, her three plastic rooms. So uh, that is even very difficult to read, and I cannot imagine how to easily translate it. I don't know whether I answered your question. Before we go to take a glass of wine, just one more question. Sorry, but it cannot be just. When you mentioned uh, uh, City Silver Sister by Joachim Topol, if I'm not wrong, it's based on a very sharp contrast between uh, colloquial check up to slang and then a written, written check of extremely correct, even literally check. So I suppose that this uh, sharp contrast has been extremely difficult to uh, translate into English, or did you pay attention to it? I hope I did, and I did translate it. So did you manage, really, to cover both those extremities? Well, it's always an adaptation, of course, adaptation of the original text to English feeling. It's a certain performance, sometimes uh, Translating is called uh, transfer of a book into a different language in a similar way as uh, a musical composition being transposed into a different uh, scale. And of course, the, the outcome will be different. Each note will sound differently. So, that's probably uh, a parallel that can be applied to that. But uh, if I thought that I would not be able to transpose it or translate it, I would not do it. And I realized very strongly that really to translate exactly, it's not possible. It does not exist. You will never get the same books, one in the original language and the other one in uh, the target language. Because translating is not to produce two identical works. Translated work must be convincing, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. convincing, yeah, that's the word. Well, we thank you too. We thank you all. And uh, stay here, and you can catch Alex whenever, uh, when, wherever you want, over the hall, and during this uh, nice evening. Thank you.